This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. Well, we are really looking ahead to uh, central bank reaction, right, as we get more data pulled to percolate through, but also that divergence between the Fed and the BOJ continuing to be a pain for the Bank of Japan. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we saw the yen move higher after that stronger than expected uh, factory gate data from the United States. We've been hearing from uh, Chris Kent here as well from the uh, RBA. He's not ruling anything in or out when it comes to the future move of, uh, of rates here in Australia either. Yeah, he was asked to give one word to describe monetary policy settings and the outlook and he said uncertain when he was speaking uh, upstairs a little bit earlier at Bloomberg offices here in Sydney. But of course, uncertainty is also uh, what we're looking ahead to in terms of how the yen continues to play out and where the intervention comes at that 152 level. We are still under that point, but looking pretty close with the dollar at its highest, pretty much its highest levels that we've seen so far this year, at least since about the middle of February. The Nikkei 225 out of the gates are stronger by about a quarter of 1%. We did have the day, the first day of the fiscal year for Japan. We are seeing uh, investors, at least at the start of this week, doing a little bit of profit taking, particularly when it comes to the big outperformers, including some of the industrial and autos names. But we are seeing broad upside uh, as the Nikkei comes online. Watching in particular some of those chip stocks, we had uh, news of potential further investment from the government for Rapidus. This is the homegrown chip maker looking to make those two nanometer uh, chips. And that would be a significant uh, uplift when it comes to some of those chip, chip and AI and tech related names. The topics also moderately higher at this point. Dollar yen trading, as I said, at that 151.58 level. 152 is potentially where we see uh, actual intervention. But of course, uh, New Year, uh, same old issues when it comes to uh, that battle between a dollar yen, right? The same old currency problem confronting both traders and the government. And there will be some uh, big questions as to how that intervention will play out and, and how long it potentially can last for, given that we know that uh, currency intervention does not tend to be very long lasting even if it is heavy handed but potentially this is another risk when it comes to Japanese equity rally. Take a look at Korean stocks and this is the setup here. We could potentially also see some of those tech related uh, chip related names in Korea reacting as well. The cost is a little bit softer but the Kosdaq index is at least just uh, just in positive territory. Let's get some more from our M Live strategist Mark Cranfield who joins us now. So Mark lots of questions as to how this yen intervention will be executed is 152 the level what will it look like and i guess most importantly how much bang for their buck do they get in terms of how impactful any move would be well the, the japanese authorities have been quite adept in the past at letting the market get into a position where they're very long of the the us dollar and then intervening afterwards so that would suggest that they will let dollar yen rise through 152 if that's the, the path it's going to go ahead for. And then they will wait until they feel the market is really overstretched and then they would do their intervention. That's been their tactics in the past and that's been much more effective. So they'll be looking for dollar yen to actually rise a bit further before they show their hand. And there may be more than one round. There are, it's quite possible that they will use successive rounds of intervention to actually come in and to su support the yen. It was unlikely to be just one hit. And that's the the way that they've, they've done it in the past. So uh, from the market's point of view, um, they won't necessarily be looking for exactly 152. They'll be thinking that it could even be closer to 153 or even higher. But certainly the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan have proved before that they're very good at taking the market off guard. Yeah, Mark, so they're good at administering the medicine, but how enduring is the medicine likely to be, especially if we keep getting data out of the US that gives us upside surprises? Um, it's, it certainly makes it um, a lot more difficult for Japan because of, as you say, now that people are increasingly looking for fewer interest rate cuts in the United States. So it may only be that two interest rate cuts get priced into the market for the rest of this year, which is obviously positive for the US dollar, and it uh, doesn't help the Japanese yen at all. But the Japanese authorities have shown they can be coming in very big size. They, they can be very persuasive. So they will be thinking they can move dollar yen by at least 500 pips. If it's at 152, knock it down to something like 147 or somewhere in that kind of a zone. So they won't be looking for a small move. They'll be looking for something significant where they can really persuade the market there on top of the situation. But the timing of it will be crucial and they'll be prepared to do it outside of Asian hours. They don't mind intervening in New York or in London.
All right, Bloomberg M Life strategist Mark Cranfield there. And our next guest expects dollar yen to weaken modestly this year. So let's bring in Hartmut Issel, the head of APAC Equities and Credit at UBS Wealth Management. So, Hartmut, let's uh, start with your views on the yen. First off, can you uh, define modest for us? And do you have a number in mind that the finance ministry will be looking to defend? Uh, on the former, cer certainly, let's say, you know, towards the year and maybe a bit beyond, let's say, you know, 144 level um, thereabouts. But uh, we, we critically look really, um, as we just also heard, I would agree with that. It really matters what happens in the U.S. Uh, think in terms of interventions. We, we, we heard it a few times uh, already in the recent past. And whether that can be really um, that effective is, uh, you know, it certainly helps the, the yen on the margin if they do. But uh, I think that remains to be seen whether we can have that effect. So yes, uh, the, the key is that um, we see broader uh, sort of sort of dollar weakness happening, and only then uh, we, we think actually the, the yen can uh, sort of outperform a bit uh, some of the other currencies. And uh, if and when it happens, what sort of impact do you expect to see on Japanese equities, which have really had a tremendous run over the past few months? Now, yeah. you would first and foremost expect some effect on the um, on the exporters, actually. So therefore, it's uh, probably good if you look at uh, exposure in Japan, where we have sort of a neutral position, um, to focus a bit more on either value or, in particular, uh, domestic stocks, uh, financial stocks in particular. I would mention. I think um, the, these are the these are the promising ones within Japan. Um, on the margin, probably exporters a bit less so. When you take a look at China, you say that you're focusing on the alpha. What does that sort of translate to when it comes to sifting through what does look like perhaps an emergence of opportunities now? Yeah. Uh, we look, what we're seeing in China is quite, quite interesting. We see a, a couple of capital measures. And over the last couple of years, that has actually sort of in, intensified, right? Also, I guess, in, in, in the absence of uh, growth like we used to see it. Uh, so that could be interesting opportunities, dividends, buybacks. And uh, we think also some of the more traditional, especially in the short term, also some of the more traditional uh, sectors there are interesting, including actually financials. So, um, yeah, this is probably an element where we think the market will focus on when these companies do more of the, the capital management. Uh, Hamid, when you take a look at the broader sort of AI and chip related rally that we see across the board and we actually just had, you know, potential reporting of more investment from the Japanese government uh, into Rapidus in, in Japan, how much further is there to go for this and what I guess is the next wave of opportunity when it comes to AI? Yeah, I would think uh, we're seeing currently probably still for, for maybe a uh, short number of months, the uh, semiconductor space, very, very strong. However, we need to remember uh, this, this is still a stick, cyclical industry even now. Uh, so we do expect, uh, and, and we're already starting or have started since since end of last year, the upturn. So we're in an upturn, arguably, on the semiconductor side. So what we think in terms of um, where we could go next in AI is that uh, maybe towards the middle of the year, or certainly in the second half of the year, uh, we already began to switch a bit of the exposure. We, we still have a lot of semiconductor exposure, but uh, piece by piece, sort of shifting it a little bit more into slightly more late cyclical, I should say, AI exposure, and especially also into software. I think uh, that is the prudent move for now. Do you see any risks to the AI story, particularly around supply chains? I, I would say I'd see only risk. Uh, what we what we're currently witnessing is that um, the, the big investments, also the, the demand for the for the semiconductors, for that matter, comes mostly from what people call the hyperscalers. So um, the important thing is that um, this this broadens, right? So that other industries are that we just heard, right? Governments uh, as well, that they really also step in, and then um, you know when the uh, sort of the appetite of the of the hyperscalers maybe flattens a little bit, that we also get other industries really significantly. Uh, adopting, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that will that will happen. Uh, but yeah, that, that's maybe a risk if they maybe time it differently. If they if they're first a bit hesitant to do it or, or, or take their time with it, then that could be uh, that could be a risk. 
Uh, have your views on opportunities in China changed at all recently? Because we had some pretty good uh, PMI numbers out over the past couple of days. Uh, do you think all the bad news is in now and we're seeing some signs of a turnaround? Yeah, certainly a, a lot of bad news. I mean, if you is, is in the price, and if you look at the better, where the valuation stands, it's, it's, um, it's about half the, the, the multiple that people were willing to pay still four years ago. You know, has, has that much changed? <laughs> is, is, is that not a little bit too much? Um, so you could see a, a bottoming here. And yeah, w within it, uh, certainly as I mentioned in the short term, probably some of the more sort of traditional sectors, are, especially when, when you see stabilization in the economy and the PMIs do suggest that, um, then, then this is the place to invest. All right, uh, Hartmut Issel, head of APAC Equities and Credit at uh, UBS Wealth Management. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, let's just take a look at how we're tracking in the U.S. Treasury space. We did see your yields uh, rising across the curve on the back of that uh, stronger than expected ISM factory gate data out of the U.S. Uh, we're still seeing some uh, uh, not, not a great deal of movement. Uh, a lot of that seems to have been priced in, but uh, also what was priced in was a uh, rethink on what's going to happen next with the Fed rate cut odds for June. Well, they're now below 50 percent. So uh, the expectation around when we're going to see easing from the Fed, that just keeps getting pushed on out. All right, a deep dive into China's economy with Societe Generale. Uh, their greater China economist is going to discuss risks to growth and uh, why they see an uneven recovery across sectors. Up next, though, our interview with the Reserve Bank of Australia Assistant Governor Christopher Kent on the nation's future framework for monetary policy. This is Bloomberg. We're seeing some very modest gains for the ASX today. Got a lot of uh, stocks trading ex-dividends, so that might explain why it's kind of a muted session. But there are a few standouts. Treasury wine performing pretty well, and this is, of course, after China uh, removed its remaining trade strikes on Australian wine. So this is the first opportunity uh, that investors have had to react to that news. Uh, material sector also performing pretty well, as we've seen a modest recovery in iron ore prices as well, after some reasonable data out of China. Energy, the other sector that's doing pretty well in Australia right now. That's better by seven-tenths of one percent. If we take a look at the Brent crude price there, that's finding a bit of support as well. Oil's holding near a five-month high. There's a few reasons for that. Um, we've got uh, what appears to be an Israeli airstrike on Iran's embassy compound in Syria. Israel's not claiming responsibility for that, but that's... Uh, threatening to ratchet up tensions in the Middle East and that conflict around Gaza. And we've also got the OPEC Plus meeting this week as well, where we're expecting the cartel to carry on with uh, some of its production curbs. So we're seeing the uh, yield on the 10-year. Meanwhile, in Australia, that's not moving a great deal. Uh, the Aussie dollar also not moving a great deal either. We did hear from the RBA's Chris Kent uh, right here in the studio a little bit earlier on, uh, really uh, holding the line that the RBA's uh, having a bob each way when it comes to what to do next with rates in Australia. And we'll have the RBA minutes coming up in a little while as well, Heidi. What to do next when it comes to the levels of the yen is one that's confounding the same old currency problem, confounding Japanese policymakers despite the start of a new fiscal year, right, Paul? We are hearing from the Japanese finance minister, Shinuchi Suzuki, speaking in Tokyo, saying that they're refraining from providing specific views when it comes to future FX moves, but saying they're not determined only by monetary policy. Of course, referring to that uh, divergence between the BOJ and the Fed and therefore the yen and the dollar. FX moves are determined by various factors, uh, talking about that it is important that those moves are stable and reflect fundamentals. Excessive moves are undesirable. We have had heard this uh, before, but the authorities are watching Forex moves with a high sense of urgencies and they're not ruling out any options against FX moves that are deemed to be excessive. There will be an appropriate response taken, according to Finance Minister Suzuki.
Turkey speaking in Tokyo now. They've refrained from providing specific view on future FX moves. We also heard from the ex-form uh, BOJ chief uh, Haruhiko Kuroda saying that the recent yen weakness he sees as being excessive as well. So we are an intervention watch. 152 to the yen is where markets see that potentially kicking in. You can get a roundup of those stories and more to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Bloomberg subscribers can get that at Debbie Go on their terminals. It's also on the mobile, in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. Uh, you can play around with those settings too for the news on the industries and asset classes that matter most to you. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at some of the movers that we're watching in just about 20 minutes or so of trading in Japan and over in Korea. Nippon Steel is one to watch. We're seeing upside about 2.5%. Nippon Steel making what it calls a formal commitment to spending and jobs to the United Steelworkers Union, backing up a pledge that it made uh, earlier as it looks to build support for that. Some $14 billion acquisition of United States Steel Corps have pledged no layoffs before 2026 as part of this US steel bid. So they've sent that document formalizing those promises there. We're also watching uh, Rakuten. They've offered one and a quarter billion dollars in a junk bond in return to, uh, in their return, I should say, to the US market. $1.8 billion of notes were sold in the US last January and they have been tapping markets to pay down debt. Uh, the tech firm returning to that high yield bond market with that one and a quarter billion offering after what has been a strong rally in debt that it sold earlier this year. Some of the other names that we're watching there are uh, Samsung Electronics. We're also seeing Tokyo electric power in focus there as well. Japan's approved almost $4 billion in subsidies to chip venture Rapidus as it commits more money to playing catch-up in semiconductor manufacturing. For more on this, let's bring in our executive editor for Asia Technology, Peter Alstrom in Tokyo. Uh, Peter, you sure can't doubt J the Japan Japanese government's commitment to this, but is $3.9 billion going to be enough to help make them a force in advanced semiconductor manufacturing? Uh, yeah, Japan is making some very aggressive bets in the semiconductor industry. It really comes in the wake of the COVID pandemic and some of the supply chain shocks that we saw at the time. The country became quite determined to rebuild some of the semiconductor capabilities it had domestically in the past. And so there are a few different ventures. They also are backing a, a fab here in Japan from TSMC, the leading maker of semiconductors right now. But this investment in Rapidus is a bit more unusual. Rapidus is a very young company. It's less than two years old. It's run by uh, a, a group of local executives uh, led by a former top executive at Tokyo Electron. And it's really a long shot bid to be able to create another foundry. So a company that will make custom made chips for customers, kind of the way that TSMC and Samsung do right now for customers like Apple or uh, NVIDIA for that matter. So Rapidus has not done this before. It's a very competitive market. It'll be competing against TSMC and they're trying to build a fab up in the northern island of Hokkaido. So this $4 billion is going to go for that construction effort. They're going to buy the equipment and they're going to try to move towards being able to create a foundry that will compete with some of the global leaders in this space. And there's also subsidies at play for the likes of TSMC as well, right? What is the government uh, given everything it's trying to do, given that it's asked for extra budget for this, what are they hoping to get for this investment? Well, uh, the investments that they're making in other places, like with TSMC and also with Micron, um, are in Kyosha is one of the local players too. Those are a bit more older generations of chips. So those are important for the automotive industry, which of course is a cornerstone of the Japan Japanese economy. Uh, that's quite important. Rapidus is really more cutting edge. They want Rapidus to be able to create advanced semiconductors that could 
uh, for, for a variety of customers, including some local customers, that could help them compete in some of the more cutting-edge areas of technology, like artificial intelligence, like some of these quantum computing, some of these areas where Japan has not been able to produce chips in the past. And really, there are only a handful of companies that can make chips that are so advanced. TSMC in Taiwan is one of them. Uh, Samsung is really another one, but the list is very, very short. So the fact that Rapidus, a company that, again, is only about 18 months old, could co sort of leapfrog into that competition and be a viable competitor is considered quite a long shot. Executive editor for Asia Technology, Peter Elstrom there in Tokyo. Well, Bloomberg opinion columnist and former New York Fed President Bill Dudley says bank regulations should focus on preventing sudden and rapid withdrawals rather than simply raising capital requirements. He told us the era of social media and 24-hour banking mean depositive runs will be much faster, outflow rates much higher. The regulators have been focusing on increasing capital on the biggest banks. They have not been focusing on how to deal with that contagion problem. We need to really build up the Fed's lender of last resort function so it's credible to uninsured depositors so they don't run. And one way to do that is to require banks to pledge collateral uh, to the window, to the discount window of the Fed, uh, equal to all their runnable liabilities. So if, if uninsured depositors know that's the case, they don't really have a reason to run. It's the contagion issue that I think was, which was so striking and powerful that we need to address. Uh, that was evident last March. Bill, do you think the keys to answering that question, though, are at the Fed or are they elsewhere? I'm thinking more about deposit insurance. Is that something we need to change and maybe change quickly? Well, you could raise deposit insurance, but that's, first of all, going to require congressional legislation. The other problem with deposit insurance raising is, that, is it basically increases what's, what economists call moral hazard. People are going to be less careful. You know, we saw during this SNL crisis that uh, banks, you know, SNLs with lots of insured deposits go out and takes lots, lots of crazy risks. So I think the addressing contagions through the lender last resort function, I think, is a better way to go uh, to guard against that kind of risk taking. We're talking about bank crises, and I'm just seeing equity markets at all-time highs and credit spreads at multi-year tides. How do you think this FOMC is thinking about what's happening with financial conditions beyond just what they look at, looking at equity markets, looking at high-yield spreads? Because when you hear the chairman talk about financial conditions, he says they're tight. When you hear market participants talk about them, Bill, they say something else. I was surprised by his answer at the press conference to the question about financial conditions. He didn't. He really didn't really want to talk about financial conditions. Where in the past he's talked about financial conditions a lot, and he actually implied that the financial conditions were still tight. I don't. I don't see that. Uh, stock markets up very dramatically. Credit spreads are narrow. Bond yields are down. Mortgage rates are down. Uh, since o end of October, we've had a dramatic easing in financial conditions. So right now there's a bit of a, a, a battle going on. The long lags of monetary policy versus the easing of financial conditions. And you know. If you're trying to figure out what the impulse of monetary policy right now is, you have to figure out what the balance is between those two things. Uh, my personal opinion is monetary policy is not really exerting that much restraint on the economy. And that's why the Fed has been on this path of being having to stay higher for longer. Um, and, and, you know, I think another aspect of it is, is that, you know, so-called R-star, the neutral monetary policy rate, is probably higher than what the Fed, Fed officials are assuming. It's very interesting to me is the Fed thinks that the fund, federal fund rate is going to go all the way back to 2.6 percent. That's their immediate projection in the long run. But if you look at the market expectations of where interest rates are going to go, they have them coming down to about 3.6 percent. So there's a 100 basis point gap between the, where the market thinks that the Fed is heading and where the Fed thinks that it's heading. And in this case, the Fed is actually a lot more optimistic about the scope for rate cuts over the next few years. Bloomberg opinion columnist and former New York Fed President Bill Dudley there speaking to Bloomberg's Jonathan Farrow. All right, let's uh, take a look at how we're tracking on uh, some of the foreign exchange markets that we follow. Uh, the Aussie dollar, not a huge deal of movement. The one that's really in focus today, though, is the yen. Also not a lot of movement, but at 151.66, it is hovering around 34-year lows. And uh, we're closely watching for intervention. We've heard some more strong words from the finance ministers, uh, from the finance ministry's Suzuki, uh, talking about uh, how they're watching these movements very, very closely, Heidi, and the yen weakened further off the back of that stronger than expected uh, factory data out of the U.S. Uh, Paul, we have seen kind of markets mostly trading range bound in this Tuesday session here in Asia. Let's take a look at how futures in Europe are settling up at the moment. We are seeing Euro stocks futures looking pretty flat. German DAX futures more or less the same. Not a great deal of conviction there. We are seeing the potential upside when it comes to European cyclicals, autos and banks potentially seeing more room to outperform as we see this equity rally really becoming a little bit broader. There has
has been increased optimism about uh, the macro scenario and the earnings backdrop in Europe there. Much more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. We are getting uh, some RBA minutes out there from uh, the March meeting minutes. And the RBA is saying it didn't consider the case for a rate rise in March. According to those minutes, reiterating they will do what's necessary to hit that inflation target. And interestingly, look, since then, we have had softish kind of CPI coming through from the February, at least for the headline number. Uh, there are some sort of seasonal factors showing pretty solid outcomes there, consistent with the expectations expectation that we'll continue to see broad disinflation as a trend. But uh, the minutes also indicating that the CPI is high but gradually returning to target and it's not possible to rule in or out future changes to the cash rate. Uh, also talking about significant uncertainties but that the risks remain broadly balanced. Those minutes also referring to returning inflation to target remaining the highest priority. And interestingly the theme of uncertainty, the inability to be able to rule in or out any measures uh, in this final leg of this monetary policy cycle was really key to uh, what we heard from the Assistant Governor Christopher Kent when he spoke earlier to us in Sydney. The RBA in the meantime is also set to switch to a new framework for the implementation of monetary policy. The Assistant Governor for Financial Markets, Chris Kent, did outline those changes in a speech at Bloomberg Sydney offices and after afterwards we asked him how those moves will help the central bank streamline its operations. What we've announced today is a new system for implementing monetary policy, what we'll be transitioning to in the future. But I wanted to emphasise that really is about the plumbing, the nuts and bolts of moving money around, about us achieving our cash rate close to the cash rate target, but it's not what that target is. What that target is, is, is monetary policy. This isn't about monetary policy, it's just how we achieve the target at any given time. But it's also about responding to perhaps some of the imbalances within the system structurally coming from the last few years. Uh, well, it's about responding to the running down of the very large level of reserves. We call that excess reserves that are in the system because we and other central banks pursued unconventional monetary policy. So they put a lot of money in the bank's accounts. Those are gradually unwinding as our bonds mature, as the TFF gets repaid. So it's about looking to the future and thinking about how, um, what we need to do to sort of uh, what system we need to transition to. When it comes to the moderation of that balance sheet, obviously a lot of it will demand, uh, d depend on underlying demand, but do you have sort of an idea of, of scale, of, of, of timing, of how that framework will play out? No, we, we don't, and indeed that's partly why we picked the system we've picked. So what we've chosen is what we call a full allotment allocation system at our OMOs. That means the banks come to us and for a fixed price they can borrow uh, reserves pledge collateral for 28 days at the moment and they can take what they want as long as they have sufficient collateral. So what that's about, what that means is the supply of reserves is going to depend on the bank's demand. The banks have their own estimates, we could come up with some rough ones, but until we get there we won't know. Um, but the, it should transition fairly seamlessly from one of excess to ample and we'll know we're there when banks start showing up in larger numbers and larger quantities at our operations on a weekly basis. I think until we get there we won't know probably you know is, is a good phrase to describe a lot of, mm. of aspects of where we're at at the moment in terms of monetary policy. Upstairs you were asked uh, you know a little bit cheekily to, to give one word to describe monetary policy settings and trajectory. I'm going to give you a few more words if you want. Can you elaborate? Yeah I think the starting point is just to say that the board's made it clear it thinks the interest rate path uh, that will best um, bring inflation down in a timely manner is uncertain. Um, and so they've not wanted to rule anything in or out with regards to interest rate uh, changes. Um, we're, we're in a better place than we had been. Inflation's come down a long way. It does look to be moderating, um, but the path, in, according to our forecasts, is a gradual moderation from here. 
Um, labour market pressures, they're easing, they're still tight, but they're easing, and that's because growth's slowing, and so that brings demand into a better balance with supply. So all those things are in place. Our central forecasts um, are sort of pr uh, predicated on sort of further good things happening, including productivity growth, but there's a lot of uncertainties around that. And I think the key point is those are rel reasonably well balanced, as best we can tell, and because of that, the path's uncertain. The next rate change, don't know if it's higher, don't know if it's going to be a lower interest rate. When you talk about the, uh, not being, the inability to rule out shocks, right, how much of those risks do you worry about that might be external, that might be geopolitical, you know, that might be uh, you know, election driven, uh, the policies of other countries, mm. uh, and, and how much of it are sort of domestic, maybe structural, macroeconomic aspects that perhaps we haven't seen in the data sets yet? I think it, it could be both, we just don't know. But I mean, as a small open economy, we're always subject to um, developments offshore. Um, we've talked quite at length about what's happening in China. China's a major export market for us. And there are concerns there about um, their property sector and the problems that they're trying to deal with there. So that can have an impact on things like the demand for our, our key commodities like iron ore, and that can move our economy around. But equally, domestically, things can uh, be moved by what people here in the, in the Australian economy are doing, particularly households at the moment. How are they going to behave uh, in the future? That will sort of be a key, um, a key point for where the economy goes. Christopher Kent, the Assistant Governor at the RBA, speaking to us a little bit earlier. Well, uh, the Assistant Governor also spoke about the uncertainties coming from China's slowdown. And there is a little bit of good news, at least in the data. The factory activity number beating expectations in March, boosting optimism about hitting that ambitious growth of around 5% this year. Growth target, I should say. Despite that pickup, though, in most sub-indexes in those PMI surveys, economists are cautioning that it remains to be seen how sustainable the rebound will be. Joining us now is Michelle Lamb, who's a Greater China economist at Societe Generale. Michelle, great to have you with us. And we know that data in the first couple of months of the year tends to be you know pretty patchy at the best of times even with uh, new methodology are you confident that the corner has turned for China's economy I think uh, judging from the March PMI data and also the January February data I think there, there is uh, some signs of the economy uh, at least uh, stabilizing or picking up but I would say that uh, there, there are actually still some cause of concerns because, for example, if we look at the January February data, um, it's true that the industrial production, the fixed asset investments are surprising to the upside. But we, if we look at the retail sales, I would say that uh, the momentum is still pretty stockish, especially on the goods front. And going back to the March PMI data, as for example, if you look at the manufacturing new orders, it seems that the majority of the pickup is driven by the new export orders. But uh, for the domestic demand, I think, especially for consumption demand, it remains to be seen if uh, it, it's really uh, starting to uh, recover more uh, notably, especially if we consider what's happening to the housing sector, which is still uh, uh, is decelerating at this stage. You talk about the sluggishness, and I think the thing that I'm always watching is is confidence, right? Sentiment, the concern about the sort of. Uh, the stagflationary uh, aspect of how households might be feeling at the moment. Do you see any signs of that staging a turnaround? I think if you that unfortunately for economists, there are actually not a lot of uh, data to really gauge uh, the consumer confidence. Um, but I think some of the indicators that we look at, for example, the, the house prices, uh, they are still falling. Sure. Uh, if you look at the MBS data and some other private sources, uh, for example, um, if you look at the stock market, I would say that perhaps the things are starting to stabilizing, but, uh, but that's actually after a big correction that we've seen around the, the turn of the year. So it really remains to be seen if we are really the, starting to feel the stabilization in the economy impact broadening uh, to the household economy. Confidence. And in terms of the wage growth, uh, I think for the quarterly data, the, we only have the fourth quarter data 
of last year, which uh, we do notice that uh, the growth momentum has still been uh, pretty sluggish, especially uh, for the urban citizens uh, compared to the rural citizens. And uh, I would say that uh, if we look at uh, some of the private uh, uh, data sources uh, in terms of the wage gains, uh, some such as the job recruitment uh, data agency, it seems that uh, the wage momentum is still not very strong for us to really see a uh, uh, big support to uh, improvement in the consumption right now. Michelle, do you think policymakers in China can claim vindication now for not using that bazooka stimulus that we'd all become accustomed to? So I think it depends on what you mean by the bazooka. Um, for example, for the monetary policy expectations, we still expect uh, some uh, policy rate cuts and triple R's cuts uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, well, given the March uh, upward surprise, it could be the case that uh, we could be seeing these kind of stimulus coming at a later stage rather than an early stage. Um, I think for the property easing, uh, They've already sent some signals that there could be more demand easing coming through uh, a couple of weeks ago. So I think we could continue to be seeing uh, some uh, local uh, government relaxing the purchase restrictions, uh, even in the top tier cities and even the mortgage interest rate cuts. But uh, there's also a question of whether we could see uh, this uh, translate into a, in, into a recovery in the housing sector. Um, I think uh, for now, uh, for the big bazooka, for example, like uh, a further insurance uh, in the special CGBs, I think the chance is uh, much uh, less likely given the uh, positive momentum we've seen for the first quarter. We had a warning from Ray Dalio this week that if uh, China doesn't get on top of its debt, it's facing the risk of a lost decade. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's true, um, uh, but I think at the same time, the, the government is uh, sending some signal that it is tackling the debt issues. For example, for the central government uh, at the NPC, they decide uh, this multi-year issuance of special CGBs to try to uh, open the new door to support uh, the financing of the key strategic projects. So I think it also allows some room for the local governments and the local government financing vehicles to cut back the debt. But I think more importantly, the China needs some structural reforms to really unleash the uh, demand of the consumption. And I think uh, even if we talk about uh, financing more infrastructure projects, that's not going to really increase the share of consumption in the overall economy. So I think that's what the policymakers really need to focus about, which is uh, to try to uh, make some reforms to the secu national security systems, maybe uh, reduce some of the payments, even temporarily, to, in, to improve the consumer confidence. And, and I think that's really most important for us, for us to uh, support the consumption demand right now. All right, Michelle Lam, Greater China Economist at Societe Generale. Thanks so much for joining us. Still to come, we're going to have a preview of Tesla's first quarter deliveries and hear why some analysts are expecting a first sales decline in four years. This is Bloomberg. The board's made it clear it thinks the interest rate path uh, that will best um, bring inflation down in a timely manner is uncertain. Um, and so they've not wanted to rule anything in or out with regards to interest rate uh, changes. That is Christopher Kent, Assistant Governor at the RBA, speaking to us earlier. Let's just check in on how markets are tracking at the moment. Uh, here in Australia, kind of going sideways at the moment, just some very modest gains. A lot of stocks trading ex-dividend today, which uh, might be uh, weighing on sentiment just a little. Treasury wines, though, performing pretty strongly after, of course, uh, just before the long weekend, China lifted its trade strikes on Australian wine. The Nikkei having another good day, but that's going to be in sharp focus as well as we keep an eye on potential yen intervention. The uh, Ministry of Finance has been making its usual noises about that today. Uh, the Kospi at the moment uh, looking kind of flat. We're also watching uh, Japanese chip makers at the moment. We had a little bit more news from the government today. It's going to give a further $3.9 billion in subsidies to its uh, chip venture Rapidus. So uh, committing more money to uh, Japan's ambitions to catch up in semiconductor manufacturing. You see that uh, rising tide lifting all boats there. Some of those semiconductor names in Japan uh, performing uh, pretty well at the moment. 
Well, let's talk about Tesla releasing its first quarter delivery results this week. Some analysts are expecting the first sales decline in four years as demand for EVs and elevated interest rates takes a toll. So for more on this, let's bring in our global business editor, Peter Verko. So, uh, Peter, tell us some, a little bit more about the reason for the slowdown in Tesla sales. Yeah, hi, Paul. Heidi. Well, what we're really seeing is that Tesla is being caught up in a kind of a broader slowdown in the EV market. Um, and being a pure EV manufacturer, it doesn't have other models to fall back on, say, the way the likes of a GM or the Toyota does. Um, just in the last few weeks, we've seen Ford slash the prices of its Mustang Mark E. Uh, Rivian is also cutting prices of its SUV. And even Apple has pulled out of its EV project, though there's more at stake there. Um, so it looks like the EV boom that we saw in the last few years may have peaked just for now. Still, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, Bloomberg NEF forecasts that EV sales globally will still rise 22% this year. It's such that that's down from the 30% growth that we saw last year, so a bit of a slowdown. And a lot of that growth is coming from China, which is a much more competitive landscape than, say, the US, where Tesla does a lot of its business. It's a huge market for Tesla, but as you say, they've increased prices there at a time when there's aggressive discounting, more than ever, in fact, from local car makers. Yeah, and we're particularly seeing that with BYD. Uh, BYD's gone on an aggressive price cutting round already this year. Its popular Seagull hatch is now less than the equivalent of 10,000 US dollars in the China market. And just overnight, BYD reported that its March sales are up 46% year on year. So it's really just going from strength to strength. So that's making it hard, not just for Tesla, but for other EV players in China. Then you've got new competitors coming into the Chinese market as well. We saw Xiaomi last week come in with its new SUV and it's selling for starting around 30,000 US dollars. The Model Y in China starts at 50,000 US dollars. So again, that's a huge gap for Tesla to make up. And so interestingly, what we've also seen in China in the last couple of weeks is Tesla trimming production at its Shanghai factory doesn't often happen by making workers work a shorter week. And then really interestingly, in the last weeks of March, it flagged a price increase that took effect yesterday. And that does really seem to be an attempt to try and pump up sales in the dying days of the first quarter. Global Business and Asia editor Peter Verko there. Uh, other corporate stories that we're tracking this hour. And Bloomberg has learnt that Tesla boosted headcount by 86% last year in Austin, Texas. The firm now has over 22,700 employees in the region where Tesla turns out its Model Ys and Cybertrucks. This officially makes Elon Musk Austin's largest private employer. Texas is home to multiple Musk firms, including a Tesla Gigafactory and the launch site for SpaceX. Citigroup is said to have implemented a fresh round of job cuts in its U.S. investment bank last week. Sources say technology, media and telecom were among the coverage areas hit the hardest, with senior bankers and junior roles affected. The cuts come as Citigroup says it has included the major actions around its reorganisation plan. McKinsey is offering nine months pay and career coaching services to some UK staff who would like to leave. The move comes after the firm earlier warned some US consultants that they were running out of time to win promotions. McKinsey and its peers have trimmed headcount and slowed the pace of hiring over the past year as demands from clients decline. Nippon Steel has made a formal commitment to spending and jobs to the United Steelworkers Union. The agreement includes an extra $1.4 billion in capital spending, as well as a promise of no layoffs before 2026. Nippon Steel's new president has pledged to press ahead with the takeover. That is despite opposition led by President Biden, who says U.S. Steel should be American-owned. Be sure to tune into Bloomberg Radio to hear more from the day's big newsmakers and get in-depth analysis there from the Daybreak team. Broadcasting live from our studio in Hong Kong, you can listen in via the app that's Radio Plus or BloombergRadio.com. More ahead, this is Bloomberg.
We're counting down to the market opens in mainland China and Hong Kong. On the earnings front, Guizhou Malte's 2023 numbers are due out on Tuesday. Bloomberg Intelligence sees the company posting 17% profit and revenue growth year on year. Let's get more from our senior analyst, Ada Lee. And Ada, Malte is always interesting, right, in terms of being a commercial or a consumer bellwether. And given the weakness that we've seen in consumer sentiment, what are we expecting? Absolutely. So we are expecting 17% growth in its sales, which will drive the sales to about 150 billion yuan this year. This is actually ahead of uh, the management target of 15% growth this year. And then what boils down to then is a 17% growth in earnings this year as well. And this is actually a very uh, robust set of results uh, that we're expecting, given that the consumer sentiment is actually quite depressed at the moment. So, uh, Ada, never mind the consumer sentiment being depressed. Uh, analysts still really like this stock. I think it's something like 51 buys. So where's the enthusiasm coming from? I think it's the fact that the company managed to develop consist, or, or to deliver a consistent uh, result in terms of its sales as well as earnings. So if you look at its gross margin, it is at industry high of 92%. I really don't think you can see any, any other companies with that type of gross margin. Its operating margin is also very healthy uh, and with the opportunity to further expand going forward. What we are looking for in this set of results in particular is actually is direct to consumer sales contribution because that is one of the key drivers for gross margin going forward. You, you talked about expansion and certainly in terms of um, product market and, and uh, the demographic expansion, Malta has been working a lot on that, particularly when it comes to enticing younger consumers, right? How much of that effort is paying off? We've seen a lot of collaborations, you know, chocolate lines, there's even a, a, a showroom here in Sydney. Yes. So they have been very, very busy over the past year in terms of both product and channel development. On product side, like you have mentioned, they have got some chocolate, they have alcoholic latte. Uh, recently in March, they also announced uh, some sparkling wine, a blueberry sparkling wine. Uh, and then end of last year, they announced a collaboration with one of the most popular artists in Asia, Jay Chow, in collaboration uh, to develop some uh, mojito product. So on product side, they are really trying to tap into the younger market as well as what I normally call the she economy, which is the ladies for the sparkling wine as well as some of the cocktail mixes. On the channel side is the development in terms of direct-to-consumer sales that I've previously mentioned. And this includes the apps such as iMaoTai, uh, which is actually growing substantially since, uh, since its launch, as well as other products such as WeChat mini apps, uh, as well as they even have a metaverse, to be honest. So they are trying in every aspect to rejuvenize their brand and to make it more younger and trendier for the younger population. All right, Bloomberg's intelligence senior analyst Ada Lee there on those uh, Kwecha Mote earnings, which we'll get later today. Time to check some of the stocks to watch when markets open in Hong Kong and mainland China. So uh, keep an eye on Chinese EV stocks. This is after NIO announced a boost in its deliveries for March. Meanwhile, its peers, BYD, Geely Auto and Great Wall Motor all reported a rise in their March vehicle sales. And Asian Tesla suppliers are going to be back in focus. Analysts rapidly lowering their projections for this week's deliveries report from Tesla. Some expect to see a first decline since the early days of the pandemic. Well, that is it from Daybreak Asia. Marcus coverage does continue as we look ahead to the start of trade in Hong Kong, Shanghai and Shenzhen. The China show up next. This is Bloomberg.